Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A nightclub manager has been robbed and killed. The killers made good their escape. Their identity is unknown. Your job, get them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, April 7th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out a homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from R&I, and it was 1.46 p.m. when I got to the interrogation room. Find anything? No, they're checking it now. Mm-hmm. Mr. Seaton? Uh, yes, sir. I wonder if you'd mind going over all that happened just once more. You might have forgotten something, some little thing that might help us here. All right. Uh, where do you want me to start? Where I came in this morning? Yeah, that'll be fine. Well, I came into work about 8.30. Is that the time you usually get there? Uh, yes, sir. It depends what time I catch my bus. Uh, usually it's about then, though. Mm-hmm. Was Mr. Kelby there then? Yeah, he usually gets in around 8 or so, comes in, looks the place over. You know, checks the register, liquor supply in the bar, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And then he goes to his office to count the money for the night before, get the deposit slip ready for the bank. Uh, that's what he was doing this morning when they came in. You see him come in? Yeah, I was in the kitchen when those two men came in. Mm-hmm. First, I thought they were salesmen. Both of them were dressed kind of nice. A lot of salesmen come in to see Kelby that time in the morning. I didn't figure anything was wrong. They say anything to you, these men? Well, no, not at first. They just stood there looking the place over. I went on peeling my potatoes. And then I heard one of them say that he guessed they might as well get it over with, and that's when they pulled the guns and told me it was a stick-up. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Well, first, I didn't know quite what to do. I asked them if they was kidding not to pull jokes like that. And I told them if it was a joke, it wasn't very funny. Mm-hmm. And then the big one came over and told me to keep my mouth shut, told me it wasn't any joke. And, and if I made a sound, they'd just soon blow my head off his look at me. Well, you just know I wasn't about to cause any trouble. Did Mr. Calvi know they were in the place? No, not then. You see, he keeps the door to his office closed when he's counting the money, and I thought about yelling to him, but then when I looked at those two guys, I thought about what they'd said about killing me. I decided not to. What did these men do then? Uh, the tall one walked over to the door of Mr. Kelby's office and knocked on the door, and Mr. Kelby said for him to come in. Mm-hmm. And they opened the door and walked in. He saw the guns, asked him what they wanted. Uh, told him they'd better get out of there with those guns, not to cause any trouble. The little one laughed at him and said they wanted the money and that Kelby was the one who shouldn't cause any trouble. I see. Ahead, well, the uh, little one started to pick up the money and stuff it in his pockets, and Mr. Kelby told him they better leave it alone, that he had friends who'd take care of him. And the two of them said something I couldn't hear. And the little one told Kelby that his friends wouldn't do him any good. And that's when they shot him. Which one actually shot him? Oh, the little one. He's the one who said that thing about the friends. Well, did you try to do anything to help Kelby while all this was going on? Well, what could I do? I told you what those guys said. Kelby wanted to be a hero, save the money, fine. I wasn't his money, belonged the owner's. Look, I tell you, Sergeant, money isn't worth that much. They nail you into that box, and they don't throw a bank book in. Those guys told me to stay put. I stayed put. What did these two fellas do after they shot Kelby? Well, the big one was real surprised, like he didn't know the little one was going to do it. He yelled at him he was a fool, said he was a stupid fool. Those were his exact words. And the little guy finished getting all the money, and then they ran out. Well, I'll tell you, I was scared to death they were going to kill me, too. It looked like it for a minute, too. How do you mean? Well, when they ran through the kitchen of the back door, a little one stopped and asked what they was going to do about me. I thought, sure, my number was up. The uh, big one said not to make it any worse to leave me alone, then they ran out of the place. And boy, that's when I called the cops and those other guys, you know, out there in the car, and then you came, and the rest you know. Are you sure that you've never seen any one of these men before? No, well, sir, I'm pretty sure I haven't. I wonder if you can give us some kind of a description on these two men. Yeah, the big one was about six feet two, maybe three. Weighed about 180 to 200. Dark. Uh, black curly hair. Mm-hmm. Anything special about him? The way he talked? Any scars? Anything like that? No, nothing. How was he dressed? Can you remember? Yeah, he had on a gray suit. Uh, Glenn Clad uh, had kind of red in it, you know? His suit looked expensive. He had black shoes, a uh, maroon tie. 
Now, how about the smaller one? What did he look like? Oh, he was a little one, uh, five, six, or seven, uh, 130, 35 pounds. He was dark, too, black hair, cut real short. Uh-huh. How about his clothes? Oh, a hat on a blue suit. Uh, looked like a gabardine. Uh, single-breasted, light blue. Had on a yellow shirt and dark blue tie. Would you know if there were any marks or scars on him? Oh, yeah, he, uh, he had a little tiny scar right here. On the edge of his mouth. Uh-huh. Made him look like he was smiling all the time. Well, these are very good descriptions, Mr. Seaton. They're going to help us a lot here. Yeah, well, like I said, I wasn't about to be a hero and try to stop these two, but I knew that you'd want to know what they looked like, so I tried to get all the dope I could. We understand. Now, during the holdup, did either of these men use any names? What I'm call the other by a name, anything like that? Oh, let me think about that. Yeah. Yeah, there was something. Uh, while they were in the office, while the little guy was picking up the money, the big one said, hurry up, Deuce. Yeah, he called him Deuce. That was a smaller one? Uh-huh. That's right, Deuce. Joe? Yeah. I'll ask the staff's office to make a run on the descriptions and M.O. for us. Check the oddity and the moniker file in the R&I office and see if they can come up with a Deuce or anything on this car. I'll be fine, Frank. Thanks a lot. Hey, uh, you got a cigarette, Sergeant? Yeah. Here you go. Thanks. Yeah, how about a match? Sure. Here you are. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Yeah, it's a terrible thing. You know, Kelby being shot, I'll probably lose my job. How's that? I'll probably lose my job. The owners will figure, sure, I should have tried to stop those guys. Well, those are the breaks. You said that when these men came in, the door to the manager's office was closed. Is that right? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Kelby always kept it closed when he counted the money, just like I said. Uh-huh. Well, when it looks like the men knew that Kelby would be checking the money at that time, doesn't it? That mm-hmm. they knew the layout of the place when they came in. Yeah, you know, I never thought of that. By gosh, that's what must have happened. They sure seemed to know what was going on. Anybody else that was usually around at that time, would you know? Anybody that might have known that the manager worked the accounts at that particular time? No, there's nobody else around. But I, I don't think that Mr. Kelby kept it a secret about the money. Was Kelby conscious at all after he was shot? Do you remember mm, that? Not more than a minute. I ran over to him right after the men left. I wanted to see if I could help, you know. Okay. Yeah, he was shot pretty bad. They'd hit him in the stomach. He was all doubled up. Terrible. He looked up at me and said, I know... And his voice kind of trailed off. That's all. Just, I know. Staff's office is making the run, Joe. We got out the local and the APB on the suspects. Nothing that matches the name Deuce and nothing on the scar. Anything from the crime lab yet? No. Checked by the office. While I was there, Murphy called from Georgia Street. Anything? Yeah, not good. What? Kelby died and never regained consciousness. With the death of the victim, any information he might have given us about his killers was gone. The one witness to the murder was shown the mug books but was unable to identify the suspects. Sergeants Gillen Sinus and Danny Galindo canvassed the neighborhood and came up with the driver of a bakery truck who thought he'd seen the killers leave the club. He told them that two men answering the description given us had walked out of the club and gotten into a late model Mercury sedan. He'd not been able to get the license number of the car, however. He was brought into the office and shown the mug books, but he was unable to point out the killers for us. In checking the neighborhood, Encinas and Galindo had come up with a waitress who had seen two men answering the description of the killers loitering around the area. She also described the Mercury sedan, but said that she hadn't paid much attention to it. Because of the smoothness with which the holdup men had operated, indications led us to believe that they had been tipped off by somebody working for the club. Proceeding with this theory, we checked with the club owner, a Mr. John Watson. We found him in the kitchen of his home. Hope you don't mind if I finish up here, officer. No, not at all, Mr. Watson. Guess it seems a little silly to you for a man to be in the kitchen kind of a hobby of mine, cooking. Yes, sir. Making a cheesecake. Got some friends coming over tonight. Figured the cheesecake might taste good later in the evening. Yes, sir. You go right ahead. We just have a few questions we'd like to ask you. About the robbery? Terrible thing. I don't understand why Kelby just didn't give him the money. Not give him any reason to shoot. Do you have any idea who might have known that the money would be in the office at the time? You know, almost everyone that worked in the place. Not making mention of the salesman that came in. Would you hand me that rolling pin over there? Yeah. Here you are. Thanks. Trust for a cheesecake's important. That's one of the reasons I make it myself. Can't stand a soggy crust. <clears throat> Are there any of your employees that you think might do a thing like this? Well, that'd be hard to say. I didn't get around the club much. Once in a while, I'd drop by, I'd chat with Kelby. He did the hiring and firing. As long as the place made money, I didn't interfere. Mm. Well, the way it looks, it could be very likely that one of the employees did it. The men who pulled the job seem to know just what they were doing. That right? Yes, sir. I wonder if we could look through your employment records. Sure, of course. Anything I can do to help out in this thing. Uh, uh, would you hand me that pan over there? Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Get this crust into it, and the cheesecake's about ready. Yeah, sure, you can look at the records. Don't see what that's going to show, but you're welcome to them. Uh, what kind of a car do you drive, Mr. Watson? Uh, new Lincoln. 
Just got it a couple of weeks ago. Any of your employees drive a late model Mercury that you might know of? No. Oh, like I said, I don't really have a lot to do with the actual operation of the club. Colby took care of that. Good manager. Did a fine job. Can you tell us how much money they took, sir? No, well, near as we can tell, it came to a little over $1,100. Some of that was in checks, you know, that we cashed for our customers. Well, that finishes that. Get this together. Now, get it in the oven. Looks good, doesn't it? Yes, sir. <laughs> you should taste it. Set it for 350 for 25 minutes, and that does it. Yeah. Now then, can I get you officers anything? A cup of coffee, something like that? No, sir. If you just arrange for us to check your employment records. Certainly. I'll call the club right away. We'd appreciate that. My brother-in-law's down there looking after things now. He's an idiot. Never could get a job on his own. I only hired him because my wife insisted on it. Yeah, he'd probably botch up the whole thing. Usually does. Well, if you'd call him, sir. How's Kelby's condition? Going to be laid up long? Well, Mr. Kelby's dead, sir. We thought you knew. No, I hadn't heard. Oh, I can hardly believe it. Such a ruthless thing. Just terrible. Kelby was such a good man. Everybody that worked for him liked him. Didn't have an enemy in the world. He had two. We went back five years into the employment records of the club. There were over 200 names. Each of them had to be checked out. Frank and I spent two months running them down. In all instances, the people interviewed had alibis or else they could explain their action at the time of the robbery and killing. In each instance, if the person owned an automobile, it was checked. A broadcast and an APB had been gotten out on the late model Mercury scene at the club, but there had been no answers. No replies had come in on the descriptions of the two suspects. June 17th, we were checking out the last three names on the list. One of the three, a David Adams, listed a rooming house on West 34th Street as his home address. We checked with a landlady, a Mrs. Elvia Collins. Adams? Sure, he lives here, second floor front. What if we could talk to him, then? Sure, I've got no reason to say you can't. Come in. Thank you, ma'am. He isn't in right now. I went out about an hour ago. Said he had to lead on a job, and I sure hope he gets it. He's a couple of months behind in his rent. That's fine. Sit down. Just take any chair. Thank you, Miss Collins. You officers like anything? M mint on the table there. Help yourself. No, thank you. Adams give you any idea when he might be back? No, he didn't say right out. I expect he'll be here by six. How's that, ma'am? That's when we serve dinner. Mr. Adams hasn't missed more than four meals since he's been living here. Um, what's this Adams look like? Oh, little man. Sort of like my first husband, little dried up man. How old would you say he is? Well, I know exactly. He baked his birthday cake last Wednesday. Forty-six candles and one for luck. About how tall would you say, ma'am? Five, six or so. How about his weight? Mm, maybe 120, and that'd have to be soaking wet. His real little man. Is he dark or light? I beg pardon? His hair, is it dark or light? Oh, light. A real silky hair. What little there is left of it. Funny the way he combs it. Never could figure it out why a man would comb his hair that way. What's that, ma'am? Well, you see, he's only got a little bit of hair on one side. He lets it grow real long, and then he combs it all the way over the top of his head so it'll look like he's got a lot of hair. He really doesn't, though. It's silly. But he's pretty vain about other things, too. Does he have any friends in the building, Miss Collins? Well, there's his two cousins. They've moved, though. How long ago did they move? Well, let's see. Must have been about two, three months ago. Yes, that much, anyway. Well, what did these two cousins look like, Miss Collins? Can you describe them? Well, you just bet I can. I had a lot of trouble with them, too, always drinking... The uh, first one, he was a big one. Six feet, anyway. Had dark hair. Weighed maybe 200 pounds. Miss Collins, how about his complexion? Dark. Anything outstanding about him? Well, now, what do you mean, outstanding? Well, I mean anything about him that struck you as being different, maybe? Anything that attracted your attention, something like that? No. Well, what about the number two man? How old was he? Well, he was a little younger. 35 or maybe 37, around there. Well, how tall would you say he was, Miss Collins? Well, he was a little man. Five foot six or seven. How much do you figure he weighed, would you know? 130 pounds or so. How about his complexion? Dark, just like the other one. Anything outstanding about him? Scars, tattoos, maybe anything like that? Yes, yes, he had a scar right on the corner of his mouth. Made him look like he was smirking all the time. It was a real dirty look. What are these men's names, Miss Collins? Well, now, the big one is called Al Evans. Uh -huh. The little one's name was Bill Evans. They was brothers. Did they have a car? Oh, yes, yes, a late one. It was real pretty. You know what make it was? No. No, I'm sorry, but I can't tell one kind from another. Sure was a nice-looking one, though. A lot of chrome all over it. Do you have any idea where they might be now, where they moved to? No, I haven't. 
Oh, Mr. Adams can probably tell you, though. I see. Oh, uh, that might be him now. I'll see. Oh, we'll go with you, ma'am, all right? Are you expecting any trouble? Uh, what's this all about, anyway? Mr. Adams done something wrong? Oh, I do hope not. He's a little man, but he's awfully nice. We'd just like to talk to him. Oh, I sure hope they won't be any trouble. Oh, Mr. Adams. Yes, Miss Collins? Uh, these gentlemen would like to talk to you. Oh, I can do for you. Are you uh, David Adams? Yes, sir, that's right. We're police officers, Mr. Adams. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? Adams. What is it you wanted? Well, it might be better if we talked in your room. All right, but I still don't see what it is you want. Did you get the job? No, Mrs. Collins, but I've got another lead. Don't worry, I'll be able to take care of that matter by the first next week. Oh, it's all right, Mr. Adams. I understand. This is it. Not much. Sit down anywhere. Thank you. You want to tell me what this is all about now? What it is that you want with me? Well, we'd like to talk to you about the robbery of the Pink Rat Cafe last April. Manager was killed. The Pink Rat, yes. I worked there a couple of years ago, but I don't think I've been in the place since then. I lost the job. <laughs> Kelby fired me for dropping a load of dishes. Did but... you have an argument at the time? Well, a little one, yeah. I was sore. He was, too. Wanted me to pay for the dishes. I didn't feel it was my fault. I told him so. He had a few words. Nothing serious, so Why? Mr. Calvey was killed in the holdup at the bar. Yes, I know. That's too bad. But you surely don't think I had anything to do with that, do you? Well, that's what we're trying to find out. Well, why do you think I'd have anything to do with it? I haven't near the place for a couple of years. Well, the way the thing was pulled, the whole M.O. makes it look like it's an inside job. Somebody had to give the layout, tell him that Kelby would be in his office with the money at that time, and all points to somebody that either works there now or who did work there. Yes, but why me? Well, your name was on the list. It had to be checked out. Adams, you got any relatives in town? Not now. I had a couple of cousins. They were out here for a while. What are their names? Alan, Bill, Evans. Mind if we look around your room? No, I got nothing to hide. Go ahead and look around. You won't find anything. Thanks. What is it about my cousins? You figure they had something to do with the thing? Well, we think they might have. Their descriptions match the ones we got from the witnesses. You've been talking to old Mrs. Collins. She's the one who told you about Alan, Bill, isn't she? Well, who told us isn't important, Adam. You don't have to admit it. I know Busy buddy, always getting your nose into somebody else's business. Oh, Harpy. Job. Yeah. Look at here. Well, what's this gun for, Adams? You never know when somebody's going to try to break into the house. It's protection, that's all. Mm. You never had it out of the house, huh? Not since I bought it. It's the 32, though. What are you so interested for? Kelby was killed with a 38. Well, he was, wasn't he? Seems to me I heard it on the radio or read it in one of the papers. No, you didn't. The caliber of the gun that killed him wasn't released. How'd you know? I must have read it in the paper, like I said. No, this won't work, mister. I think maybe we better talk to you downtown, huh? You gonna arrest me? Just like to talk to you downtown. Let's go. Well, sure, but I got nothing to hide. Well, you still gotta come up with an explanation for knowing about that gun. The description we got matches your cousins. You know about the gun. You got a lot to explain. I don't want to go to jail. It's too bad, Adam. You should have thought about that before you got involved in this. Well, if I tell you, if I help you get the guys that did it, will you give me a break? Well, we can't make any deals. Well, I don't want to go to jail. You can't do anything for me, huh? All we can do is see that the district attorney's office knows that you've helped. But you'll tell him, huh? I give you a hand? He'll know about it. Okay. I got claustrophobia putting me in a cell and drive me nuts. I tell you who did the job more than that. Yeah. I can show you the gun they used. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Listen to what the nation's press has had to say about Chesterfields. Atlantic City Evening Union. Wholesalers and retailers report an extraordinary demand for Chesterfields in both sizes, with sellouts in many instances. Cleveland Press. Dealers everywhere report the big pack sale phenomenal. Last week in Cleveland, some areas reported the long size Chesterfield outsold all other brands. And from all over the country, we're getting reports from dealers telling us no product they ever handled has grown so fast in so short a time as king-size Chesterfields. Yes, with a buying public today, high quality for the money is a must. And that's why so many smokers are changing to Chesterfield. First cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king-size. King-size Chesterfield is exactly the same as regular Chesterfield, except it's larger. Contains so much more of the same tobacco it gives you a 21% longer smoke, yet costs very little more. And the tobacco in king-size Chesterfield is of better quality and higher price than the tobacco in any other king-size cigarette. Try Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king-size, they're much milder. 
Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. We took David Adams back to the office and checked the gun with pawn shop records. It was clean. We printed him and checked him through R&I. We took him over to Westlake Park and he showed us the approximate place in the lake where the gun had been thrown. He explained that his two cousins had talked him into helping him with the robbery of the club. He also said that as soon as he found out that there'd been a shooting, he'd washed his hands of the entire affair and told them that he'd have nothing more to do with it. The loot from the robbery had been divided between the two cousins, Adams taking no part of it. It took us two hours of searching before we were able to find the gun. It was turned over to Russ Camp in ballistics. He fired test shots from the gun, and comparison with the death bullet showed that it was the murder weapon. Markings on the shell casing found at the scene of the crime were the same as those left on the test casing. Adams told us that Bill Evans owned a late model Mercury sedan and that the two brothers had left for St. Louis in the car. He also was able to give us the license number. We checked with DMV and they told us that the legal owner was a finance company on Crenshaw. The manager there told us that their payments were up to date. They were able to give us a St. Louis address used as a reference by Bill Evans. We called the St. Louis Police Department, gave them a rundown, and asked them to pick up the Evans brothers for us. The witness to the killing was unable to identify David Adams as one of the holdup men. He was taken to the main jail and booked on suspicion of 287 PC. Frank and I waited for word from the St. Louis Police Department. They're all the same, aren't they, Joe? What do you mean? I'll put any of them in a tight spot and they'll spill all they know to save their skins. Well, it seems that way, doesn't it? Adams seems pretty sincere, though. It seems like he does really want to help. I will know more when we hear from St. Louis. You figure that Adams is telling the truth? I don't know. The story seems to check out about how he laid the thing out for him, uh-huh. showing us where the gun was. Uh-huh. Being that far back in his room, Rand, it'd make that part about him not taking any of the money fit. I'll get it. Homicide, Friday. Yeah, I'll take it. Mello. Yeah. Yeah, we've been waiting to hear from you. Did you pick up the Evans brothers? Uh-huh. Yeah, wait a minute. Toss me that pad, will you, Frank? Yeah, here. Thank you. Yeah, all right, go ahead. Uh-huh. What was that again? I didn't... Yeah, I got it. Okay, thanks. Anything we can do for you, give us a call. Yeah, sure, we sure appreciate it. Right, bye. What does it? What do you mean? St. Louis checked the address. They'd been there all right, but they left this morning. Any idea where they went? Yeah, the Evans boys told us. Huh? They left a forwarding address. Motel out on Ventura Boulevard. Frank and I notified Captain Lorman of the new developments. We talked to the manager of the motel, and she told us that she did have a reservation for June 24th under the name Evans. She told us that they'd be in Cottage 12. In view of the fact that the suspects had not been alarmed, we decided not to put out an APB on the car. We felt reasonably sure that having made the reservations, they'd keep them. But in the event the suspects arrived earlier than expected, a surveillance was placed on the motel 24 hours a day. Sergeants Howard Hudson and Bill Cummings took the period from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., Frank and I covered the other 12 hours. Directly across from the motel was a used car lot. We talked to the manager, and he gave us permission to sit in any one of his cars while keeping the place under surveillance. As we relieved each other, the police car was taken back to the city hall so there would be no indication that the place was staked out. Four days passed. No sign of the suspects. June 23rd, 4.32 a.m. Joe. Yeah, Mercury sedan. License checks. Two men. Stopping at the manager's cottage. They're ringing a the bell. Uh, yeah. Looks like they're signing the register. It must be. There. She's giving him the key. All right, let's let him get to the cottage. We told her we would. All right. And there's the landlady's signal. Let's go. All right. Move your car. Huh? You gotta move your car. Put it in the back. What do you want? Stand up, hey, Joe. Come, Bill. hey, Joe, get the other one. Yeah. Get away from the cop, man. Oh. All right, give it up, mister. I'm getting out. You got any brains? I'm not trying to stop. You're going no place, mister. You can't get over that wall. Throw that gun out of here. You haven't got a chance. No, sure, You'll never take me. Get a doctor for me, huh? Oh, it hurts. Yeah, we'll call one. 
shouldn't have to shoot, did you? Lousy deal, you didn't have to shoot. You didn't give me much choice, mister. I wasn't trying to hit you, just trying to scare you, that's all. I didn't want to hit you, I'm a good shot. I knew what I was doing. Yeah, you proved you're a good shot. What do you mean? When you killed Kelby. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 4th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. First such report ever published about any cigarette. Yes, and it applies only to Chesterfield. A responsible consulting organization has reported the results of a continuing study by a competent medical specialist and his staff on the effects of smoking Chesterfield cigarettes. A group of people from various walks of life was organized to smoke only Chesterfields. For six months, this group of men and women smoked their normal amount of Chesterfields, 10 to 40 a day. 45% of the group smoked Chesterfields continually from 1 to 30 years, for an average of 10 years each. At the beginning and at the end of the six months period, each smoker was given a thorough examination, including X-ray pictures, by the medical specialist and his assistants. The examination covered the sinuses as well as the nose, ears, and throat. The medical specialist, after a thorough examination of every member of the group, stated, quote, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six months period by smoking the cigarettes provided, unquote. Now remember this Chesterfield report. It's the first such report ever published about any cigarette. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. Buy Chesterfield either way you like them, regular or king size. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. <laughs> William M. Evans and Alfred T. Evans were tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. They received life sentences in the state penitentiary. Because David R. Adams had turned state's evidence, and since he was not actually involved in the crime, in the interest of justice, the charges against him were dismissed and he was released from custody. This program is dedicated to the 59th Annual Conference of the International Association of Chiefs of Police held in Los Angeles this week. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. These great programs sound off for Chesterfield. Radio. Dragnet, the Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis show. And every weekday, Arthur Godfrey time. On television, Dragnet, Gangbusters, Arthur Godfrey and his friends in the Perry Como show. Tomorrow, you'll want to sound off for Chesterfields. Because either way you like them, regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Broadcasting Company. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the first cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you great men.
over the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. Nothing. 
None of the victims could describe the suspects other than to tell us they were male, white Americans, and that one of them spoke with a southern drawl. 11.17 p.m., we arrived at the hospital. The victim had been placed in treatment room number three. Dr. George Hall was treating him. Frank and I went into the room to talk to the doctor. Hi, Joe. Frank. Hi, Johnny. How is it? Oh, it's all right. Suffering from shock. Got a nasty abrasion on his right cheek. I gave him a sedative to quiet him down. He'll be okay in a few minutes. Mm-hmm. What happened to him? I have a trunk bandage again. Vicious bunch. You going to release him, Doc? Yeah, I'll be all right in 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, you know his name? I want to make out his treatment card. No, he'll pass out on us before we could get him. Uh, uh, he's coming around now. Oh, uh, you're all right now, fella. Just relax. Take it easy. Uh, here, uh, see if you can sit up here on the edge of the table. <laughs> Joe? Yeah, Doc. You want to pour a glass of water cups over there on the wall? Yes, yeah, sir. I'll get you some water, sir. That's it. Now, just sit quiet. Then I yelled, 
Stick the feet against the trunk. I just about given up when you found me. Not sure I was through. It's getting hard to breathe in there. Mm-hmm. I can imagine. No, you can't. Until you've been locked in the trunk. Nobody can imagine that. Terrible. Just terrible. Say, have you called me? That's my wife. Have you called her? No, she really haven't. Oh, she'll be hopping there. What time is it? It's 11.45. Almost four hours to get a pile of coffee. She'll be raising the roof. Would you call her? Tell her where I am? Yes, yeah, sir, I'll call her. Want to give me the number? Uh, Madison 34656. Uh-huh. Tell her you're calling for Henry. Explain what happened. All right, sir, right away. Officer? Yeah? Be sure to tell her you're a policeman. She'll believe you. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, I have a couple of questions to have to solve this card. Sure. I hate to ask. Could I have another cup of water? I'll get it now. What do you want to know? I know your full name. Henry J. Hilde. H-I-L-L-D-A-L-E. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Hall and I took him into the mudroom to look at the books. Frank 
got in touch with Stewart from the police printing lab. We gave him the description of the suspects and their M.O. and the fact that one of them spoke with a southern accent. We asked him to run off 500 flyers for distribution in the area that we were going to canvas. 12.15 p.m. Sorry, Sergeant. Didn't recognize any of them. Oh, that's all right, sir. I understand. Don't think his picture was there. I'd feel awful if I saw it and didn't recognize it. But I'm pretty sure you just don't have a picture of the man. Yes, sir. Well, maybe you'd like to rest a little bit before you look at any more. Yes, I can. Get a little confused looking at so many. After a while, they all begin to look alike. Yes, sir. Nobody's seen or heard of them. I never realized there were so many hotels in L.A. 
Yeah, there's a lot of them. Well, let's try this one. All right. Lane, this is my class. What little there is left of it. Have you 
see Mr. Barlow? Yes, sir. We talked to him when we came in. I think he's in the clinic now. He said you could give us the stories, all right? It was a Lambert boy. He came into class about five minutes late. Uh-huh. We're just starting the lecture on analysis. I told Douglas to take his seat. He said something I couldn't hear, but he went back to his place, and I went on with the lecture. Mm-hmm. I guess it was about ten minutes later that the commotion started. The first thing I knew about it, Larry McLean started to yell at Lambert, said something about keeping his mouth closed. Mm-hmm. Then Lambert said something about McLean minding his own business. I started off the platform to quiet things down. By the time I got to Douglas, he'd hit McLean. And after that, it's all a little confused. Flying apparatus, chemicals being thrown all over the place, glass breaking. The whole class seemed to explode. But were the other members of the class fighting, or was it just the two boys? It seemed like the whole class was fighting. At the time, it seemed like the whole school was in the room, all throwing things. Mm-hmm. Finally, I got the Lambert boy aside, and then the fight seemed to stop. In the meantime, he'd thrown a bottle of sulfuric acid at McLean, burned his face and his chest. The ambulance took him to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, and nurse here gave him first aid. Well, do you have any idea what started the argument here? No, I'm not sure. As I got it later, it seems that Douglas made some remark about a young girl working next to him. I didn't hear it, but I gathered that it was a pretty filthy statement. McLean heard it, and that's when he told Douglas to keep his mouth closed. Mm-hmm. Lambert is known as a sort of troublemaker, then, is he? Yes, and it's so hard to understand. Sir? Well, up until just lately, I'd say the last two months or so, he was a model student. He had a straight-A average. I wonder if we could see the boy. I guess so. There isn't anything much I can do here. Terrible. It'll be a couple of weeks before I can hold a class in here again. Terrible. Yes, sir. Big clinic down here. Have you any idea what might have caused this change in the Lambert boy? Well, I have my own suspicions, but... He's only 15, it's hard to believe. What's that? When he came into class today, I think he was drunk. Oh, why do you say that? I noticed that when he came into the room, he wasn't very steady on his feet. It had to be something like that to make him do this. Then, too, when I grabbed him when they were fighting, mm-hmm. I thought I smelled liquor on it. Oh, we go in here. Fine. Here's the boy. Douglas? Yes, sir. These men would like to talk to you. Yes, sir. Captain yes, Police. Mr. Friday and this is Mr. Smith. Hello? Thank you. Sit down, sir. Yes, sir. How's Larry? I don't know. They took him to the hospital. If you don't mind, Mr. Friday, I'll check with the nurse, see how badly Larry was hurt. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Uh, son, you want to tell us what this is all about? There's not much to tell. Larry and me got in a fight. Mm-hmm. Well, what started the fight, sir? No, I don't know. He just wanted to cause trouble. Him and me never have gotten along. Always had trouble. You been drinking, Doug? Why do you ask that? Because I want to know. Have you been drinking? How about it, boy? No. Where would I get something to drink? Well, now, something's a little wrong here, son. According to what Mr. Lane tells us, looks like you might have been drunk when the fight started. He tells us that you said something to a young girl in the class. That's what started the whole thing. You know he's lying? Is he? Sure. He's on Larry's side. The two of them are real thick. That's not what he told us, Dad. From what he said, he's pretty fond of you. Said he couldn't figure out what happened to you lately. Well... He's okay, but why does he say I was loaded? That's a stupid thing to say. Yeah, especially if you weren't. I'll tell you what, Doug. Hmm? Let's get a traffic investigation car over here and take a toxometer test, huh, just to be sure. Why? What will that prove? So we'll straighten it out once and for all, whether you're drunk or not. How about it, boy? Shall I call the car? Doug? No, you don't have to do that. I had a couple of drinks. Nothing serious, though. Just a couple of drinks. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Where'd you get the liquor, son? I don't remember. No, this won't work, boy. We'll find out. You know that. Well, I don't see what difference it's going to make where I got it. I've been drinking a couple of years. I know how to handle it. I know what I'm doing. Mr. Friday. Yes, sir? See you a minute. For sure. What's going on? Something wrong with Larry? I don't know, sir. I thought he was okay when they took him to the hospital. The nurse said she took care of it. They said he was going to be okay. All right, boy. Let's go. Where are you taking me? We want to talk to you downtown. Something has gone wrong, hasn't it? Something's wrong with Larry. He's dead. No, son. Larry's all right. He's burned, but he's going to be all right. You're lying. I know. You want to take me to jail. Well, it's not true, son. We just want to find out where you got the liquor. Yeah. Well, I haven't done anything. A couple of drinks, that's all. What's the harm in that? Come on, son. You've got a lot to explain. Okay. Take me in. Put me in jail. I don't care what happens. Yeah, you've already proved that. <laughs> 6 p.m. Frank and I talked to Charles Barlow, the vice principal of the school. He told us the same story that we'd gotten from John Lane. He said that until a few months before, Douglas Lambert had been a model student. 
He was above average in his classwork and took part in all school activities. Suddenly, and without apparent reason, he had become the number one troublemaker in his class. His attendance record became one of the worst, and his attitude toward his teachers was arrogant and discourteous. The principal told us the same attitude was being displayed by other students in the school. We notified Mrs. Lambert that we were taking him to Georgia Street Juvenile for questioning. We filled in Captain Stein on the development, and then Frank and I questioned the Lambert boy. He was sullen and uncooperative. I don't know what you want with me. A little fight, that's all it was. What are you guys trying to make something big out of? You've already done that, Doug. Maybe you don't know what you've really done. Maybe we ought to fit in on a few things. That might not be such a bad idea. Tell me how I'm a criminal. Tell me I was a bad boy. Go ahead, tell me. Don't get smart, son. What do you want me to do? Sit here and listen to you guys yank at me? You expect me just to sit here and let you guys tie a rap on me that I haven't got coming? You got one thing on me. I had a couple of drinks, that's all. A couple of drinks. No harm in that. I don't feel so good. Why don't you guys leave me alone? I got a headache. Larry McLean's got more than a headache. So the kid couldn't have started anything he couldn't finish. He wanted to be a big man in front of the class. He was. Now he's hurt and he's trying to blame me. It won't work. Cop and you know it. That's enough of that. I'm a minor. You can't touch me. That's the trouble with you, kid. You think because you're under 18, the laws don't mean you. You can't touch me and you know it. Don't worry, Doug. Nobody's going to touch you, but let me tell you a couple of things. You sit here and figure you're a big man, a real tough kid. You don't have to tell me. Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm getting sick and tired of having kids like you walk around the streets, your minds and hands filthy, bragging about what big men you are. You do what you want. You don't care about what it means to the people around you. How you hurt them doesn't matter. Everything's fine until you do something wrong and we nail you. Right away you start screaming minors that you're a juvenile, just a kid acting normal. You steal a car for a joyride. An officer starts after you. You don't care who gets in front of the car as long as you get away. You don't let anybody stand in your way. Men, women, kids, they're all the same to you. Run them down. Show them that you're just a healthy kid out for some fun. After all, you're just a kid. The laws weren't meant for you. You're different. Well, there's another kid lying in a hospital right now. He's got real trouble. He got in your way. He didn't feel that you had any special rights. Be a big man, Doug. You go tell him that you knew what you were doing when you threw that acid at him. You tell him that you were just having a little carefree fun. Tell him that you know how to handle liquor. Tell him that he's going to spend a long time with a plastic surgeon because you're just a kid. You tell him that his face is going to be like that because you're just a normal, healthy, growing boy. I hope you're real proud of yourself. I hope you feel good. You burned it right into your brain. There isn't any place you can go to get away from it. All right, boy, let's go. Wait a minute, Mr. Friday. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I acted like that. All right, so you want to try to make things right with Larry? You want to help us out on this thing? Yeah, I guess so. Where do I start? Where to get the liquor? A place in your school. Kids call it Sam's Club. What's the address? I don't know. I'll show you the place. You say it's a club? Well, sort of. You have to know the ropes before you can get in the place. Well, what do you mean, the ropes? Well, they only let kids in. You ring the bell to the house, and then when they answer, you stand there with a $5 bill in your hand. Mm-hmm. That way they know you're okay. Who is this Sam? I don't know his last name. The kids just call him Sam. He run this place all by himself? No, there's his wife, Inez. She's usually around. Just these two around the place, then, huh? Yeah, that's all I know about. It always seemed to me that Inez was really the brain. She was always telling Sam what to do. Hmm. How'd you find out about this place, Doug? One of the kids at school told me about it. He took me there one night. Then after he introduced me to Sam and Inez, I started to go there by myself. What's it like inside? They have a bar or anything like that? Oh, yeah. You walk into the living room, and there's a big bar along the right wall. It's all chrome and leopard skin. Real nice. There's a few tables around and a record player. Mm. They sell anything else in this place besides liquor? I don't think I know what you mean. You know what we mean, Doug. Yeah, I guess I do. Well, how about it? Well, yeah, you can buy tea if you want it. This $5 routine, what happens to it? Well, drinks are six bits a piece, six or a buck and a half. If you want to give them the five as you come in, you can have as much as you want. Otherwise, you pay for each thing as you get it. You always smoke marijuana? Well, almost all the kids there do. How much you? If you don't, the other kids call you a coward. We well, still haven't answered the question. Yeah, I've smoked it a couple of times. Can you give us the names of the other youngsters who go to this place? Well, wait a minute. I'll help all I can, but I'm not going to be a squealer. I don't think it's squealing, Doug. No, you don't have to give them names. Why not look at it this way, boy? You got trouble because of this Sam and I and theirs. Now, the same thing could happen to one of the other kids that go to this place. You want that to happen? No, but... Well, the best way to see that it doesn't is to tell us all you know about the place. Isn't that right? I guess so. I'll give you the names. Do they allow girls in this place, too? Yeah, as long as you know the $5 bill, then anybody can get in. They allow adults? No, if they figure you're over 18, they won't let you in. Especially at the Saturday night parties. What kind of those? Every Saturday night, Sam and I never throw a party. For five bucks, you get all you want to drink and smoke. Sam told me once it's a good business. Makes for a better customer relation. Mm. You ever see any other narcotics on the premises? I've never actually seen any myself. I've heard that if Sam or I never know you real well, you can get a pop of heroin. But like I said, I've never seen it myself. Most of the kids that I know, the ones from school, just go there for drinks. Anything else you 
you think we ought to know? No, nothing that I can think of. How about these two? You let them drive a car? Yeah, Sam has a little Nash Rambler, dark green. Once in a while when we stay over at lunchtime or when we're late getting home, he drives us home or back to school. All right, Doug. Your mother ought to be here by now. If we need your help in getting Sam and Inez, we can count on it, huh? Yeah, I'll help all I can. Okay, sir. Let's go. Just say, Sergeant. Yeah? I'm sure sorry about the way I acted. Really made a fool of myself. I hope you'll forgive me. That's all right. But you'd think there'd be an easier way, wouldn't you? What's that, son? To grow up. He checked the name Sam and Inez through R&I and came up with a Sam and Inez Bailey. Both of them had long records for contributing to the delinquency of minors. Both had served time in the county jail. Douglas Lambert was shown mug shots of the couple and identified them as the owners and operators of Sam's Club. We checked with Captain Stein about picking them up, and it was agreed that the best way would be to catch them in the act of selling liquor and narcotics to juveniles. We talked to the Lambert boy, and he told us that it was the custom of the Baileys to hold a party every Saturday night. He told us that most of the youngsters who frequented the place would be there at that time. He put in a call to the house, but there was no answer. 6.15 p.m., Frank and I drove out to the place. It was a small cottage in the back of the lot. The landlord occupied the house in front. We rang the bell to the manager's house. Yeah? Mr. Halsey? Yeah? Police officer, sir. My name is Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? I'm sorry. Want to come in? Well, it might be better, sir. We'd like to talk to you about the Baileys. Worst tenants I ever had. I knew they'd end up with the police. Why do you say that, sir? Well, I just do, that's all. They got a lease on the house. And if I could figure a way to get them out, I sure would. They're always causing trouble. They're all those kids. Yes, sir. Do you have any idea where they are now? Why, are you going to arrest them? I hope so. Maybe I can break the lease that way. You know where they might be now, sir? No, I don't know. I shoved off this afternoon. They didn't say where they was going. They just left. I wonder if you could let us see their house, sir. Why? Well, we'd like to look it over. Sorry. Well, I don't know. What, what do you want for? Well, we think they're selling liquor to miners. Yes, they do a thing like that. The noise they made. The neighbors on both sides have been screaming. Can you let us into their house? You just bet I can. Wait, I'll get the key. Here's some place. Let's uh, put one of those little key rings. You know the kind with the rabbit's foot? That's it, Try to keep your officers waiting. I know I'm always away. If you want something, you, you can always lay your hand right on it. And then when you're looking for it... Oh, here it is. See that rabbit foot. Well, you can go out the back door this way. Right, Hello. What are you looking for? What do you think you're going to find back there? We're not sure, sir. Frank. Yeah, Joe. You want to stay out here and let us know if they come back? Yeah. I'll wait in front of the house. Yeah. It's funny about them. What's that, sir? Well, when they first moved in, they said they wanted the locks on the door chains. I told them that it'd be okay, but they'd have to give me a key to the place. They had quite a ruckus about it, but I stood my ground. They wasn't going to buffer all me, no, sir. Here, I'll, I'll get the lock. All right. Okay. Hmm. Smells like they haven't had a window open in a year, Sergeant. Yes, Look what they've done to this room. They built a bar and everything. You sure were right about them. I think I can break the lease on this. I'm pretty sure. It says in the contract that they can't do any building without my permission. I certainly didn't give them any okay on this. Yes, sir. This is the dining room? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Just pull those doors back. What's that smell, Sergeant? I'm not sure, but I think it might be narcotics. Look, I knew it. I knew it all along. Oh, just wait till you get back. I'm really going to tell them. I really am. Glad you didn't do that, sir. What? Glad he didn't let them know that we were in here and if you know anything about this. Well, why? You're, you're going to arrest them, aren't you? You're not going to let them get away with it. No, sir, but we understand they've got a party planned here tomorrow night. If we wait until then, we can make a charge stick. Oh, you mean they're going to have a drunken ball? The kids here smoking marijuana, taking heroin and stuff like that? Well, we're not going to let them go that far, sir. We're going to need your cooperation here, Mr. Halsey. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, sir, we want to install listening equipment in here. We'd like to use your house. You mean you're going to bug the place? Well, yes, sir. We'd like to put in microphones. Well, would it hurt the puppet? I mean, would you have to put nails in the walls, you know, stuff like that? No, sir, I don't think so. Oh. Well, then, then you can do it. Yes, sir. I want to help, Sergeant. That's the trouble with people nowadays. You know, they don't want to help. You just go right ahead and put your, put your microphones in, just as long as you don't have to nail anything in the wall. All right, sir. If we could go back to your house, I'd like to use the phone if it's all right. You bet. Closing out so they won't know anybody's been here, huh? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. 
Don't guess I'll leave any fingerprints on the door. It'll hurt. No, sir. I don't think it will. No. Can't be too careful, though, you. But then I guess you know all about things like that. Yes, sir. I'll go around the front and get my partner. Yeah, sure thing. The fellas all work in teams like this? Yes, sir, most of the time. Well, I never knew that before. Do you have any idea at all where the Baileys might have gone? Did they give you any indication at all, sir? No. No, I saw them leave this afternoon, just got in the car and left. Did they take any luggage with them, suitcases, would you know? Not that I could see, no. Uh-huh. Hi, uh, you find anything? Yeah, the bar's in the living room. Uh, and what the Lambert kid said was true, huh? It looks that way. How long about the dope in the dining room? How you open the door and smell the fumes? Smell one? Yeah, it smelled like that. Find any? No, I didn't go over the place too good, and I thought if we were going to wire the place, we'd better get on it. Yeah. If we could just use your phone, sir. Oh, yeah, you bet. Come on in. Right there, on the table in the hall. Oh, thank you, sir. Isn't a phone call, is it? No, sir. Well, of course, not to make any difference. Just thought I'd ask. Yes, sir. You figure this will get in one of those detective magazines? Well, I don't know, sir. We've got nothing to do with that. Well, you know, of course, I didn't figure that you did, but... If it, if it does, I hope they spell my name right. It's S-E-Y. Uh-huh. Yeah. Some people forget the E, you see. Uh-huh. Spell it with just the Y. 2838, please. As the other Joe Friday. Want to install a ditch graph at 825 North Lucerne. Yeah, 825 North. Mm-hmm. Right away. Yeah, well, you know better than I do. When you see the place, you can figure. Yeah, the house in the front of the lot. What? Oh, maybe 30, 35 yards? Yeah, okay. Right away. Yeah, good. We'll be in the house in front. Yeah, all right, we'll see you then. All set? Yeah, as the old coming right out. Good. You say, Sergeant? Yes, sir? I just uh, happened to think of something. Might not mean anything. What's that, sir? The other day, I think it was Monday. Yes? Yes, I'm sure it was Monday because I I just come back from the log. You know, I always pick up my stuff on Monday. Yes, sir. Well, when I came back, I met Mr. Bailey. He was... Putting around with the car. I asked him if he was going to take a trip. He said no, but he said he might get out of town for a little bit. I didn't find you anything about the road. What road, Mr. Hawkins? Down to Mexico. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. And now, a report... Oh, honey, I tell you so. Okay, don't worry about it. 
Come on, let's get on with the sociable. What do you have, Lud? Whiskey, I guess. Good deal. You want to stick? That's some nice stuff. Then real good. Yeah. That's my boy. You're a good kid. Some of the other guys come in here. I guess I don't have to drive around this jerk. Well, I see I can trust you. Oh, excuse me. You've got to pick the other kids up. Okay, I'm going to pay. in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Detective Sergeant, you're assigned a homicide detail. You get a call that a man has been murdered. His killer is unknown. Your job, get him. Here's what the tobacco trade press has had to say about Chesterfield's U.S. Tobacco Journal, Boston, Massachusetts. Chesterfield cigarettes in the new king size is still maintaining large turnovers in this area. Dealers report that sales continue to climb on this size, and it seems that volume on the regular size has climbed to new heights with its big brother. And Tobacco Leaf reports from Chicago, more calls for Chesterfield king-size cigarettes than for most brands being marketed. Dealers all over the country tell us no product they ever handled has grown so fast in so short a time as king-size Chesterfield. King-size cigarettes give you quantity. But only Chesterfield King Size gives you quantity plus quality. Premium quality. Chesterfield King Size contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other King Size cigarette. In fact, the only difference between Chesterfield King Size and Chesterfield Regular is that the King Size is larger, contains more of these same tobaccos, enough to give you more than a one-fifth longer smoke. So remember... Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give smokers premium quality in both regular and king size. 
Ask your dealer for Chesterfield. Either way you like them. Premium quality Chesterfields. And much milder. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, May 12th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. It was 8.04 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. That's you, Joe? Yeah, I'm sorry I'm late, Frank. I got held up in traffic. Okay, no problem. I'll sure be glad when I get that freeway finished, won't you? Around the end of the pass this time in the morning, you can't go more than 10 miles an hour. Yeah, cars really climb up around Franklin. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, when we get through tonight, I'm going to go straight to bed. I might not even stop to eat. All right, what's the matter? Have trouble getting to sleep last night? Well, I wouldn't have had any trouble if I'd had the chance to do it. What do you mean, I don't get it? My brother-in-law. Oh, what do you have to do with it? Well, a couple of weeks ago, he sent away for one of those courses in hypnotism at home. Uh-huh. Book got to the house yesterday right away. He's got a new career, going to go into the hypnotism business. All right. Yeah. Book tells how if you do it right, you can have full control over people, make them do things you want, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Right away, he's got to practice on somebody. We just finished dinner, and I was all settled down to watch television. He comes in with this little book, a little bitty mirror and a candle, and the first thing he lights the candle and tells me to look at it. Concentrate, you know. Yeah. I told him to go take a run and jump, and right away, Faye joins in and says I don't want him to get ahead. And I said something about the fact that he could use one, and then it started. Ends up with me sitting there and him trying to control my will. Oh, did it work? I don't know. Waved his hands in front of me and flashed the mirror in my eyes, and I fell asleep. Yeah. And right away, wakes me up, wants to know how it felt, and what it was like when he put me under. I told him he didn't, and I just went to sleep, so... He kept trying to use what this book calls post-hypnotic suggestion. You know, while I'm asleep, he says something I'm supposed to do when I wake up. Oh, yeah. yeah and then he woke me up and waited for me to do it. Well, what do you want you to do? I never found out. He just sat there and looked at me. Every time I'd doze off, he'd wake me up so I could do whatever it was he suggested. And around 1.30 this morning, he gave up. He said the book wasn't any good and he was going to get his money back. All the time, Faye's sitting there just watching, miserable. If I'd known what it was he wanted me to do, I'd have done it to get him off my back. Never did find out what it was. No. This morning, wouldn't even say hello. Figured I wasn't cooperating, I guess. I get it. Mm -hmm. Homicide, Friday. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, it is. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, well, what was that address again? Yes, ma'am, we'll be right out. Something for us? Yeah, a woman out on Burns Street, 6425, says her son's been murdered. Frank and I drove out to the house. It was a typical residential neighborhood. When we got there, a crowd had gathered around the front of the house. A radio car had arrived, and the officers had gotten the people back from the lawn and the entrance of the house. We went in and met the woman who had placed the call, a Mrs. Edith Curtis. She was a woman in her late 40s with graying hair. As we talked to her, she kept wringing a handkerchief in her hand. Jeff was cleaning the gun. Middle of the week, he looked at it and said that it needed cleaning. He's always home on Saturday, so this morning he said he might as well get at it. After breakfast, he got out all the things he uses, put them on the table in there, and started to clean the gun. I was in the bedroom, tidying up the place. I heard these loud voices and then a shot. I I went to the living room, and I saw this man standing there. As soon as he saw me, he turned around and ran for the door. I yelled at him, but he didn't stop. What would you do then, ma'am? I went over to Jeff. He was just lying there, still and quiet. I could see where he'd been shot. I knew he was dead, and then I called you. Before you got here, the other men, the ones in the car, got here. But it was too late. My boy was dead. Terrible. Just terrible. Yes, ma'am. I'll go see if my partner's finished with the call, Mrs. Curtis. Would you like us to call your family doctor? No. Very kind of you, but I'll be all right. This house has been full of tragedy. Last couple of years, nothing but sadness. I'm used to it. I guess the good Lord makes you used to it. If he didn't, I don't think a mother could go on. Ma'am? My youngest daughter, Alice. Two years ago, this next month, the 24th, she killed herself, Sergeant. It almost killed me, too, losing her. Yes, ma'am. That's why I say I'm used to it. I got to the point after Alice was dead where I couldn't see any reason for going on. 
Then I figured that the good Lord must have wanted it this way. And I wasn't the one to say it was wrong. Alice was going to have enough trouble as it was. I don't think I understand. Suicide, Sergeant. The one unforgivable sin. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Joe. I called them. Checked with the fellows in the car. They're looking around the neighborhood. Miss Curtis. Yes. I wonder if you could give us a description of the man you saw. We'd like to get out a call on him. Of course. I saw him pretty good, just standing there looking at me. Well, how old a man would you say he was? Maybe 35 or 40. Not any older than that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. How tall would you say he was? Taller than you. About how much taller? Oh, maybe a couple of inches. I want to make him about 6'1 or 2, is that right? Yes, I think that's pretty close. About his weight, how heavy do you think he was? I'm not very good at that. I guess about 180, around there. Uh What about his clothes? What was he wearing? Could you remember? He had on one of those blue denim outfits, you know, the trousers and the jacket, light blue. Mm -hmm. Then the coat had that dark blue trim, knitted around the bottom and collar. Had on a white shirt, no tie. And a pair of those shoes with the real thick soles, that rubber. Mm -hmm. Anything unusual about him? I don't think I know what you mean. But did he have any marks or scars, anything that might make it easier for us to identify him? No, not that I could see. But you won't have any trouble identifying him. I'll tell you if you have the right one or not. Did he have a car? Would you know that? I don't think so. I didn't see one. All right, thank you, Uh ma'am. I'll call us in right away, Joe. Get out the local and APB. Yeah. Miss Curtis? Yes? Could you tell us exactly what time the shooting took place? Not exactly, but I'd say about a quarter to eight. Uh Uh-huh. Did this man say anything to you? No, not a word. You never saw him before, maybe around the neighborhood, the stores, in the street someplace? No, I never saw him. I know that. But if I see him again, I'll know him. All right, ma'am. I'll be right back, Joe. Okay. I hope you won't take offense, ma'am. What's that, Sergeant? Well, you don't seem too greatly concerned about your son's death here. I thought I'd explain that to you. I told you that I have to figure that it's the Lord's will. Mm -hmm. I might as well tell you, Sergeant. You'll probably find out anyway. What's that, ma'am? Well, Jeff and I had a few arguments. Nothing serious, but we did have words. I beg your pardon, ma'am? Well, I told you that my daughter took her own life. Oh, yeah. She lived with us here in this house. I thought it was a happy home. I found out it wasn't. I found out too well. Mm -hmm. You see, Alice, that's my daughter. Yes, ma'am. Well, she was going to marry. She'd met a young man who worked in an aircraft factory. She seemed to think he was very nice. I couldn't see much in him. I told her so. We had quite a few rows about it once when he was here. Mm -hmm. On that night, the row... Alice's young man left, made quite a fuss about my trying to run the children's lives. Told Alice that he'd marry her right away that night. But when they were married, he didn't want to have anything to do with Jeff or me. Well, did Jeff take any part in this quarrel? No, my, yes. Finally, the young man stormed out of the house. Alice was in tears, just seemed to go to pieces. That night, she took an overdose of sleeping pills. I'll never forget when I called her for breakfast. Terrible. That's not doing any good. I'm sorry, Sergeant. That's quite all right, ma'am. Now, you said you and your son had several arguments. Was it about this engagement thing? Yes, after Alice's funeral. Jeff seemed to sulk around the house. Then at night, he'd go out and drink quite a bit. He seemed to think that I'd caused Alice to do away with herself. I tried to tell him that I didn't, that I was just as sorry as he was. I told him how badly I felt, but it didn't seem to do any good. Well, have you heard from Alice's fiancé since that night? He was at the funeral. Well, what's his name, Mrs. Curtis? Dudley. Bruce Dudley. Uh, Do you know where we can get in touch with him? I think Jeff had his address. I can look for it. Thank you. But you don't think that Bruce had anything to do with this? I know it wasn't him. I know Bruce. I know what he looks like. It wasn't him in the living room. Well, we just want to talk to him, ma'am. Of course, he might have hired someone else. No. I'm sure Bruce had nothing to do with it. Even with what he did say. Ma'am? That night, when they had the fight, Jeff told him that if he didn't get out, he'd throw him out. Mm -hmm. When he left, Bruce said that someday our meddling in other people's lives was going to backfire. That it might take some time, but that we'd be repaid. And that look in his eyes when he went through the door. Sergeant? Yeah? Maybe he did do it. He looked mad enough to kill us both. Nine twelve a.m., the coroner arrived and removed the body. The men from the crime lab crew went over the place. A complete set of pictures was taken before the body was removed. 
blatant prints went over the rifle on the table and the cleaning apparatus. Frank and I noticed that the tablecloth on the living room table had been on the floor when we got to the house. Mrs. Curtis had told us that her son had grabbed it as he fell to the floor. We talked with the neighbors. One of them, a Mrs. Alvin Kemper, said that she had been watering the lawn between 7.30 and 8 a.m., but that she had seen no one enter or leave the Curtis house. She told us that she had heard frequent and loud arguments between Mrs. Curtis and her son. Frank and I drove out to the address of Bruce Dudley. It was a modern one-room apartment on Riverside Drive in the San Fernando Valley. We rang the buzzer a second time and waited. Looks like he's not in. Yeah, what time you got? Uh, 12.17. He's probably gone out. Come on, we can check the manager. Yeah? Well, Mr. Dudley? Yeah, what do you want? Well, police officers would like to talk to you. Okay, come on in. Just got up out late last night. I don't feel at all well. I move those clothes and sit down. I'm going to put a pot of coffee on. Oh, I feel like a troop of midgets ran barefoot over my tongue. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. What do you want to see me about? You know a Jeff Curtis? Yeah, I know him. Hey, what'd you say your names were? Well, my name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. You got any bad? Something to prove that you're cops? Yes, sir. Here's my ID. Uh huh. Sergeant Joseph Friday. Okay. Now, what's this about Jeff? He's dead, Mr. Dudley. Dead? Yes, sir. How'd it happen? Accident? Well, we're not sure. He didn't kill himself, did he? Why do you ask that? I just thought he might have. Sister killed herself. Thought he might have done the same thing. Do you know of any reason that he'd do something like that? Oh, no, not that I could name. I understand you and Mr. Curtis didn't get along too well. We got along all right. Oh, when Alice and I split up, there were some worries, nothing serious. Well, the way we got it, you were pretty sore at him. Yeah? Yeah. I understand that you and he had quite an argument. He was ready to throw you out of the house. Now, you've been talking to his mother. She's been throwing lies around again. Well, is it true? Did you and Curtis have an argument? Yeah, I got nothing to hide. You been out of the house this morning? No, why? You have any way of proving you were here all morning? <laughs> Just got up. You know that. You guys got me out of bed. What are you trying to prove? Just want to know if you can account for your time, that's all. You think I had something to do with Jeff's death, is that it? We didn't say that. No, but you meant it. Oh, excuse me, I gotta get the coffee. You want some coffee? No, no, thanks. How about you? No. You don't mind if I have a cup, huh? No, sir, go right ahead. Thanks. Ah, uh, let's face it. You guys really think I had anything to do with what happened to Jeff? We're not paid to say what we think. We try to get the facts. Yeah. But if I was you, I'd concentrate on Mrs. Curtis. I wouldn't put it past the old bat to kill her own son. You check around the bars in the neighborhood. Talk to his friends. I'll tell you. His mother was scared to death that he'd marry one of these days. Walk out on her. He used to be on his back all the time about the girls he went out with. I knew some of them. Alice and me used to double date with him once in a while. Mm-hmm. They ever have any arguments about this while you were around? A couple of times, yeah. You don't believe me, why don't you check with Harry? He'll tell you the same story. Lord knows he went through enough of it. Harry? Yeah, Jeff's brother. He got married, oh, let's see, about five years ago. Moved out of the house, locked, stock, and baggage. He went through a thrash with his mother about it. He'll tell you about it. He used to come over to see Jeff once in a while after he got married, but the old lady caused so much trouble that they started meeting at a bar. Got to the point where Harry wouldn't go in the house. Check with him, he'll tell you. You know where we can get in touch with him? No, I haven't got the address. Look it up in the book, Harry Curtis. I think it's out on Selma, someplace in Hollywood. All right, sir. Where do you work? Meyer Aircraft. I'm a toolmaker. You work the day shift? Yeah, I'm off today. Hey, what's this for? Just wanted to know where we could reach you. You still think I had something to do with it, huh? No, we didn't say you did. Your name came up and we had to check it out. Yeah. Well, there were a lot of times when Jeff and I didn't get along. I won't try to tell you that there weren't. I never do anything to hurt him. Got enough in his hands with that mother. Yeah. Sure, one night when we came home from a date, Alice, me, Jeff, and his date, we're sitting around the kitchen having something to eat. Mother came in madder than a wet hen. Raised Kane, told Jeff to get the woman out of the house. Jeff told her he wouldn't have her talk to the girl like that. He thought quite a bit of her. Mm-hmm. And the old biddy walked right over and slapped the girl across the face, told her to leave Jeff alone. Said she'd rather see him dead than tied up with a girl like that. 2.40 p.m., we drove back to the office. There'd been no replies on the local or the APB. We checked the names of Jeffrey Curtis and Bruce Dudley through r and I. There was no record on Curtis, but Dudley had been arrested twice for LAMC 4127C, being drunk in a public place. He'd served sentences in the city jail on both charges. We checked with the coroner's office, and they told us that Curtis had been killed by a 38 caliber bullet. It had been fired at close range into the back of his skull. The bullet was booked for evidence, and we made out a dead body report. We put in a call to the brother's house, but we were told that he was out of the city, and he wouldn't return until sometime that night. We left word for him to call our office as soon as he returned. We checked on the suicide story given us by Mrs. Curtis and found that an Alice Curtis had taken her own life by an overdose of sleeping pills two years before. 5.20 p.m. 
Frank and I drove out to talk to Mrs. Curtis again. You want to look at Jeff's room, don't you? Yes, Miss Curtis. This way. When we were here this morning, you didn't say anything about your other son. Harry? Mm-hmm. Well, you see, Officer, Harry doesn't care much for me. I know it's hard to believe that a boy would desert his own mother, but that's what Harry did. He got married, and right away his wife started to cause trouble between us. A rifle your son was cleaning this morning. Oh, yes. Those men from the crime lab, I think they said they took it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, did your son do much hunting? Well, he used to. He used to do quite a bit before Harry got married. They used to be great pals. Mm-hmm. Mother couldn't ask for a better pair of sons. And when Harry left home, Jeff sort of gave it up. He cleaned the gun when he had to, but he didn't go after game anymore. Then, too, he was afraid to leave me alone at night. Ma'am? Well, we've had a lot of trouble with prowlers in the neighborhood. Had to call the police a couple of times. They didn't find anybody, though. Mm -hmm. These are your son's clothes, ma'am? Yes. This man you saw this morning, did you notice if he had a gun? Yes, he did. It was a revolver. When I came into the room, it was still smoking. Mm Mm-hmm. Did your son keep any other firearms in the house? Oh, no, just the rifle. I wouldn't have any other guns in the place. I don't like them. Mm. You had any call to go up in the attic lately, Mrs. Curtis? What? The attic, ma'am. Have either you or your son had any reason to go up there? No, I don't think we've been up there since we moved. Could I get you officers a cup of coffee or anything? I've got some nice fresh cake. Like a slice of that? No, ma'am. Thanks. Just the same. Oh? Yeah. Look at here. Yeah. Look at here on the shoulders of these suits in the back. Mm-hmm. You see this dirt? Looks like it came down from that door to the attic. Yeah. Let me get a chair and we'll have a look. What's this all about? I told you we haven't used that attic. Don't you believe me? We'd just like to take a look if you don't mind, ma'am. Well, maybe I do mind. It's just going to take a minute, ma'am. I think you officers have sure got your nerves. I tried to be nice to you, help you out. Isn't enough that my boy's dead. Now you have to come in here and tear my home apart. There's something up here, Frank. I yeah, I can reach it. Yeah, here it is. Get my pencil. Have you ever seen this, Mrs. Curtis? No. I haven't got any idea how that gun got there. Doesn't belong to us. What do you think, Joe? I don't know. Thirty-eight caliber. are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. And now a report every smoker should hear. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. First such report published about any cigarette. A responsible consulting organization reports a study by a competent medical specialist and staff on the effects of smoking Chesterfields. For six months, a group of men and women smoked only Chesterfields. 10 to 40 a day, their normal amount. 45% of the group have smoked Chesterfields from 1 to 30 years, for an average of 10 years each. At the beginning and end of the six months, each smoker was given a thorough examination, including x-rays and covering the sinuses, nose, ears, and throat. After these examinations, the medical specialist stated, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six-month period by smoking the cigarettes provided. Remember this report and buy Chesterfields, regular or king size. Premium quality Chesterfields and much milder. We took the gun back to the city hall. It was checked for fingerprints, but none were found. We checked with pawn shop records, but the gun had not been registered. By checking with the manufacturer, we got the retailer's name. It had been sold to the victim, Jeff Curtis. The gun was turned over to Russ Camp for the routine check through ballistics. Just a minute until I take it out. Right. Okay. There's the end of the comparison, Mike. There we are. What's the matter now? Violations here. Got a make, Russ? Yeah, a match. 
11.46 p.m., Harry Curtis called the office. He was surprised to hear of his brother's death, but said that he would be down to see us in the morning. Frank and I checked out, and the next morning we drove out to the house on Burn Street and picked up Mrs. Curtis. We talked to her in the interrogation room. This is perfectly ridiculous. I don't understand what you're trying to get me to say. Well, maybe if we lay it out for you, ma'am. Yes, that might do it. At least it would be something. All right, when we walked into your house yesterday morning, you said that nothing in the house had been touched, that everything was just as it was when your son was killed. Is that right? Yes, I guess I said that. I'd like to have you be sure one way or the other, ma'am. What did you say? I said that. I hadn't touched anything. Nobody did. Uh-huh. Would you tell us what your son was doing when you left the room? I told you he was cleaning the rifle. Uh, on the living room table? Yes, that's right. What did you say he did after he was shot? I said he fell down. Did he touch anything as he fell, brush up against anything? Well, when he fell, he grabbed the tablecloth, pulled it down with him. Yes, ma'am. Well, then maybe you can explain how it was that all the things he used to clean the rifle and the gun itself were still on the table. What? How is it those things didn't come off the table when he pulled the cloth off? I don't know what you're trying to get me to say. Well, we'd like for you to tell us the truth. I'm telling that. All right, ma'am. When the crime lab went over to your house, they found two places in the kitchen floor that had been filled in with plastic wood. The job didn't look very old. Well, what's wrong with that? Jeff took good care of the house. He might have tried to plug up some place where ants were getting in. When the men from the lab dug up the patches, they found two thirty-eight caliber bullets underneath. They checked them with a bullet that killed your son. The bullets came from the same gun. I don't know what you're talking about. What does all this show? You talked about the prowlers. Said you had trouble with them in the neighborhood? That's right. What action did you take to stop this? I called the police. Mm-hmm. Had them come out and try to find the person who was causing the trouble. When did you call the police last? Three weeks ago. We've well, checked the reports, ma'am. There's no record of anyone having called the police to check prowlers in that neighborhood for the past six months. Are you trying to make me out a liar? Is that what you're trying to do? We're trying to get the truth. Frank? Yeah, Joe. You want to check the office and see if Mr. Curtis is here yet? Yeah, sure. You brought my son here? Yes, ma'am. We've got to get the truth to this. Well, why did you have to get him involved in it? Well, as I said, ma'am, we're trying to find the facts. You don't believe what I've told you? Well, no, ma'am. You've made it a little difficult. How can you say that? Well, first you tell us that nothing was touched, yet the physical setup doesn't make that possible. You deny knowing anything about the gun when we find it, but we find two bullets that have been fired from the same gun embedded in the floor of the kitchen. You told us about prowlers in the neighborhood, but there's no police record of it. Your next-door neighbor says she was out in front of her house all morning, but she didn't see anyone enter or leave your house. We find the murder gun up in the attic. You told us you saw the killer leave the house with a gun. Your son died instantly. Now, can you tell us who put the gun there? No, ma'am. There's too much here that doesn't jump. They got you into this, didn't they, Harry? Yes, Mother. They're trying to tell you that I killed Jeff. They want me to tell them that I killed my own boy. Tell them. Tell them I wouldn't do a thing like that. Not my own boy. I'm afraid I can't, Mother. What do you mean, you can't? The officer has just told me about it. Well, who are you going to believe? The policeman or me? Your mother? You don't give me much choice. What? I love you, Mother. you got to believe that. I know that whatever you did, you thought was right. I know you didn't mean to hurt Jeff. I know that. And you think I killed him, too? Don't you? Harry, give me an answer. You think I killed Jeff, don't you? Yes, Mother. Well, I did. I didn't think I meant to do it. I think I just wanted to frighten him. He was running around so much. Those tramps who were seeing terrible women, I had to keep him home. I had to keep him with me. It was all I had. I'm not young anymore, Harry. You went away, then Alice. Jeff was all I had. I didn't want him to leave, and he was going to. We had an argument. He was cleaning the gun. I got the revolver. That way I knew that I'd always have him with me, that he wouldn't leave. I pulled the trigger. Then I knew what I'd done. That Jeff was gone, too. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know. You've got to believe that, officer. Yes, ma'am. Do you believe me? That I just wanted my boy. I wanted to keep him. That's all any mother wants. I tried to keep my boy. Well, maybe that's what was wrong. What do you mean? You tried too hard. The 
story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 4th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Each of our dragnet case histories is based entirely on facts taken from authentic police files, and everything we tell you about Chesterfield is based on facts, too. Chesterfield, for example, was the first to name its ingredients. Chesterfield tells you what it's made of, because you should know what gives you the best possible smoke. Now, that brings me to the report that George Fenneman and Hal Gibney read earlier. That, too, is based entirely on facts. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfield. First such report ever published about any cigarette. Remember this the next time you buy cigarettes and ask for Chesterfield. Regular or king size, premium quality Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Edith A. Curtis was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree and was sentenced to the state penitentiary for women, Tehachapi, California. While serving her sentence there, she died from natural causes. Murder in the first degree is punishable by death or confinement in the state penitentiary for life. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Herb Ellis, Helen Cleave, Whit Connor. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Tomorrow, sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. <clears throat> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.